Last week, we were gaining an appreciation for the splendors of the papacy by considering some of the great pope saints of the past, most especially Pope St. Pius V and the first pope, St. Peter. This week, we'd like to move closer to our time. In fact, we'd like to move to our century and consider the pontificate of the great Pope St. Pius X. I'm Julius Smetona. This is what Catholics believe. With me today are Fathers William Jenkins, uh, pastor of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus Church in Parham, Ohio, and publisher and editor of the periodical The Roman Catholic, and Father Clarence Kelly, uh, spiritual director of St. Joseph's Novitiate in Round Top, New York, and superior of the Society of St. Pius V. Uh, Reverend Fathers, Pope St. Pius X was born in Italy in uh, 1835. He was born in poor and humble surroundings, but yet uh, demonstrated uh, tremendous gifts of intellect, uh, a very uh, affectionate and friendly nature, which was also part of a fiery temperament that he had. And from the earliest day, he had a, a great consideration and concern for the poor. It's said that if, uh, if he met someone poor and he didn't have something, he wouldn't eat until he had it. If that still do, didn't do it, he would then simply go beg for that person in question. He literally would give away everything he had. Uh, a very typical characteristic of this man who uh, was, was certainly one of the great Pope Saints of, of, the, of history and is very often characterized by the modernist as some kind of a tyrant. Uh, his personal life is certainly nothing like that. Well, Father Kelly, didn't the professor at uh, one of the New York seminaries mm -hmm. refer to him as a rat? Yes, uh, a professor of dogmatic theology uh, in uh, class one day in the presence of two other priests said that uh, St. Pius X was the rat who headed the ship against the modernist. Mm -hmm. And the Cardinal Mary Delval, his secretary of state, was, a, was the Gestapo chief. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because St. Pius X was very firm in defending the rights of God, the rights of the church, the truth, uh, the correct uh, morality, and, uh, and everything that is a part of our Catholic heritage. What would these professors have called our Lord when he threw out the money changers from the temple? Probably a very understanding God, oh. a, very, uh, a God with very little understanding, <laughs> I would say. Uh, you know, it's interesting, too, that uh, there's a saying, the eyes are the mirror of the soul. And if you consider one of the pictures we have of Pope St. Pius X, it's a picture toward the end of his life where he was uh, Pope and he was wearing the tiara. And you see uh, a great kindness on his face, and it's also tinged with a certain amount of sadness. He has altogether an otherworldly look on his face. This is hardly the countenance of a rat or a, of a Gestapo agent. He was very sad about the turn of events in the world. Uh, he, being consumed with the love of Christ and the love of souls, was very sensitive to the great evil that was spreading everywhere. In fact, in the very first encyclical that he wrote, uh, which was published two months to the day after he became Pope, he said things were so bad in the world that it may be that we are living in the latter days, that these are the end times, and that it is possible that the appearance of Antichrist is imminent. That is in the very first encyclical that and he published. And he said he might even be in our midst at the... As he did, world. yes. And he said because the thing which will characterize the religion of the Antichrist is the worship of man and that man is replacing God in society. Man is becoming the center of everything and God is being ejected from his creation. And he said, this is characteristic of the religion of the Antichrist. You know, what's kind of a mystery to me, I think, is that in the beginning, every pope was a saint, perhaps the first, however many, for several hundred years. And then, was it Pope Liberius who was the first who was not a saint? I can't quite recall. In some lists, he is included as a saint, but in many he is not, okay. precisely because of his weakness toward the semi-Aryan heretics and uh, his very bad treatment of St. Athanasius, who was trying to uphold the true mm -hmm. faith. And again, at a, a great critical point in church history, God raised up Pope St. Pius V. And again, I believe there were no saints for a certain period of time before St. Pius V. And what's really interesting is that there was not a single Pope Saint for almost 400 years after St. Pius V. And the first one was Pope St. Pius X. And he was given to us in our day in a 
completely providential manner. And, uh, at a time when the world really needed him. At the so. time when, when we really needed him. Let's just consider his pontificate. Uh, there's three things that, that just jump out at me. Number one, he is the Pope of the Eucharist. He, he, is, uh, he had children receive uh, Holy Communion at an average age of seven because he said that it's uh, not a good idea to let them be assaulted by these evils and without spiritual fortification. Sometimes 12 or 14 they would only receive Communion. He is the Pope of daily Communion and he is the pope who fought the modernists vehemently and right. s put off the dark day of reckoning for quite a few years. He was a pope who also loved the Holy Mass. He reformed the uh, church music, which in his day was very theatrical mm -hmm. and operatic, mm -hmm. and he wanted the dignity of uh, a true Catholic music to return to the church. It's kind of a commentary on today when you have so much popular music going on in the Novus Ordo Church because it is simply abdicated to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Pius X would, as you mentioned earlier, go in as our Lord with the knotted cords and drive them out of the churches, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, uh, he was elected in 1903, by the way. I don't know if we mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Pius, uh, St. Pius V died in 1572, and he was the last pope canonized a saint until uh, St. Pius X was elected in 1903, he died in 1914, and he was canonized, I believe, sometime in the 1950s. 52. You know. uh, by uh, Pius XII, who said, I believe, it was the greatest act of his pontificate. Mm -hmm. You know, again, one, one is just struck by Pope St. Pius X's charity. It's, uh, again, he often, he once pawned his ring, his, his ring to help a poor person. And once a bishop visited him, and at this point, uh, he, St. Pius X, rebuilt a church, re repaired a hospital, and incurred a tremendous debt. He was a very good administrator, though. He always paid his debts. And the bishop said, you're not going to be satisfied until you've pawned the thurible. And then he said, to keep you from further folly, I'm going to make you canon of the cathedral, rector of the seminary, and chancellor of the diocese. <laughs> That and kept him out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> kept him busy. If not. And again, when you look at these pictures of St. Pius X, you see a, a man who was a very handsome man, and at the same time you see an expression of tremendous kindness, an altogether otherworldly look on his face. You know, uh, it's not generally known that Pope St. Pius X was associated with a number of miracles. Uh, once someone approached him and talked about miracles that he was associated with them, and he replied in kind of a whimsical way that, well, in this world, one must do a little bit of everything. <laughs> and, Including perform miracles. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and there was an instance... What about a, that stocking story? Oh, there was a story, too, where a, a woman touched her afflicted foot to his stocking, and she was cured of an affliction. And this was brought to St. Pius X's uh, uh, attention, and he, in a kind of a self-deprecating way, said, look, and I don't know what she's talking about. I put on my stockings. My feet still hurt every day. You know? <laughs> and, but the, the most notable one that I, I'm aware of is of a, of a case when there was a paralyzed a man who had a withered, paralyzed arm, and, and uh, during a papal, uh, you know, he, he was greeting the audience, audience, right, a general audience, and uh, he was yelling, Holy Father, Holy Father. And... Uh, he caught St. Pius X's attention at that point, and he said, look, you know, I, I, I can't work. I have a family to support, but I, I can't work. Please help me. And uh, uh, St. Pius X said, trust in God, trust in God. And then, then he came Didn't up. Did he touch him or something? Then he did more. He came up and he touched him. He said, do not, do not lose hope. The Lord will heal you. He touched him. And immediately he regained full use of his arm, and right. he started yelling, "Holy Father, Holy Father!" And unlike, not unlike the Gospels, Pope Saint Pius X had a motion him to remain silent. Keep it to yourself. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. But again, just talking about what he did, he had he published this tremendous encyclical, Pascendi, against the doctrines of the modernists, and maybe we could just consider that a little bit, because I think it was for our day that he wrote that. He. Um, well, let you talk about that. You're the theologians. I'm not. Well, Bashandi Domenici Gracious was a great encyclical of Pope St. Pius X. It was written in 1907. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was that same year that uh, uh, Monsignor Robert Hugh Benson, a great English convert, uh, first published his book, The Lord of the World, about mm -hmm. the coming of the Antichrist. A very interesting mm -hmm. book about the reign of man. And in Pashendi, St. Pius X uh, gave a long explanation of the errors of modernism, in which he called modernism kind of the, the uh, sewer of all heresies, kind of the summation of all heresies. 
that uh, heretics had ever come up with. Um, he uh, he blasted it absolutely, and he he was congratulated after writing Pashendi. He was congratulated by a cardinal who who told him that the encyclical was very powerful against the modernist and evidently was succeeding in uh, in turning them back, or at least driving them underground. Pope Saint Pius X sadly responded that the modernists were going to have to go underground for the time being, but in in half a century, he said, mm -hmm. the latter half of the century we're living in right now, the modernists would be back to lay waste the church. A little prophecy that came true, certainly through Vatican II. But in 1910, Pius X had to publish another, uh, another measure in which he insisted that everyone who was promoted to major orders, the subdiaconate, diaconate, priesthood, and certainly episcopacy, or who assumed the responsibility of hearing confessions or preaching in a Catholic church or teaching in a Catholic school, had to first take an oath, and that was called the anti-modernist oath, a profession of, of the true faith, the traditional Catholic faith, and a statement that he rejected the errors of the modernists. That oath stood, and every single one of these people I described had to make that oath before he could go on to teach in a Catholic school or preach in a Catholic church, etc., until in 1967, Paul VI scrapped the oath, saying it was no longer necessary. <laughs> You're watching what Catholics... Fathers, it's, it was clear that it was a, a tremendous gift uh, that we received, a tremendous grace that Pope St. Pius X lived in our age. What is, what is the most important thing from his pontificate that, 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 we, that applies to <coughs> our times? What can we go back and draw upon and, and grasp to so to speak, stand fast in this, this, this turbulence that we're living in today? Well, I think probably the most significant thing in the life of Pius X was that he was the champion of the traditional faith and the great enemy of modernism. Now, most people probably don't know what we mean by modernism. They may think that we're talking about simply being modern or uh, updating things and so forth and so on. But modernism is not uh, being modern at all, in fact. It is, uh, it is, it is a word used to disguise uh, an attack on Catholic morality, Catholic doctrine, and Catholic worship. And Pius X did something that the modernists were uh, uh, not prone to do, which was he organized their thought. Because the modernists uh, count upon confusion, uh, they count upon uh, the inability of people to understand what they say, uh, and uh, they avoided organizing their thought into, uh, you know, into one volume, let's say. And Pius X came along and he organized their thought in order to expose uh, their errors. So that if you take the encyclical of Pius X and you read what he has to say about Catholic doctrine, about philosophy, about history, and so forth and so on, and then you go into the average modern seminary, and you will see that what they teach in these seminaries are the things which were condemned by St. Pius X. So we face now the entire hierarchy, as it were, in our defense of Catholic tradition. And many people say, who are you to do that? Why should we think that you are right and that all of these bishops and the post-conciliar popes uh, are wrong? And the answer is that it is not a question of us against the hierarchy, really what it is, it's a question of the hierarchy of the last 25 years rejecting what the popes have taught for the last 2,000 years, and most especially, and most particularly, what was taught by Pope St. Pius X, which reflected what his predecessors had taught. So all you have to do is go to that encyclical, and you see uh, that uh, judging the changes in the light of that encyclical, makes you choose. You must choose either between Pope St. Pius X and what he represented and the post-Vatican II reform. You cannot reconcile the two. You cannot have both. You must make a choice. Either you accept the reform and reject Pius X and his predecessors, or you embrace what the popes have taught before and you reject the reform of Vatican II. And is, by the way, Julius, we can probably make available for people 
copies of the encyclical Poiscendi Dominici Gregi so they can read what the Pope himself had to say about modernism. And as they read, it's, it's uh, not the easiest reading in the world because modernism is a mess. Mm -hmm. it's, a me it's an intellectual mess. Mm -hmm. And it takes some very careful surgery to kind of lay it out and dissect it. But that's what the Pope does very carefully. Uh, it's a rather lengthy encyclical, but there's a lot in there. And as people read it, I, I, I think they'll begin to recognize certain things that they've heard, possibly from the pulpits in their churches or coming from their bishops. We had a very similar thought. I can recall reading it, and you will see he lists some of the errors and condemns some of the tenets of modernism. For instance, evolution of dogma. Mm -hmm. I'm sure people have heard their bishops say, I believe in the evolution of dogma. That is a proposition which is condemned. It's modernist. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, what, what's interesting is that when you apply uh, the teaching of St. Pius X to the post-conciliar popes, you start having a tremendous, uh, a tremendous contradiction. For instance, go ahead. Well, okay. I'm sorry, maybe I'm anticipating you a little bit, but one of the prime points that Pope Pius X makes about modernism is this. He says that modernism holds that culture is the, is the expression of the, of the religious sense of man. And uh, it's not essentially a supernatural thing. It, it comes from within man's religious sense and expresses itself in culture. So culture is like a certain population's religion. And religion is a certain population's culture. And we see that whole idea oozing out of Vatican too, like out of one huge wound, infected wound. The idea of a, a culturalization or whatever they call it, where you have to bring uh, cultural aspects of the people into the liturgy to make it really a valid expression of those people's you know, inner life. This is uh, really a heart and soul of modernism. And we see that uh, running idea going right through uh, John the Twenty-Third, Paul the Sixth, John Paul the Second, uh, that the culture is something intrinsically holy. There is no one in the world who is a more effective teacher of this idea than John Paul the Second. We have the situation in Papua New Guinea where he had a, 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 leader, a reader, a woman, who was semi-nude. And this wasn't because he was weak or didn't want to offend people. This is the, the modernist idea of the culturation. It is their idea. It is their ideal, mm -hmm. actually. This, well, for them, is liturgy, the culture expressing itself. The, uh, that, that is why they put the whole liturgy in the vernacular in the first place. They had to shatter the Latin bond holding the liturgy together and, and uh, reduce liturgy to be a cultural expression only by making it a vernacular uh, liturgy could they do that. You know, it's interesting, too, that the most recent episode just happened a few weeks ago. Uh, John Paul II met with African or some voodoo priests. And this, again, I mean, people might find this shocking, and, but it's completely logical and consistent with the Second Vatican Council, with the modernist idea of this, this religion and culture being, uh, uh, being linked in a certain sense. But I, I think what I'd like you to comment on is the following. This, this teaching, when, when John Paul II you know, encouraged the voodoo priests and that they... they what exactly did he say? Well, he essentially said that he, they inherited a rich tradition from their forefathers, that uh, he they should be grateful to them. They should be uh, grateful to them. And here's people who, who eat people. Uh, you know, they do voodoo and the little voodoo dolls. This is part of their ritual. All one has to do is look at the old Catholic encyclopedia. Yeah, they used to uh, engage in cannibalism. Hmm. Well, I've read that he recommended those. that more and more of the culture, of this kind of culture, be introduced into their local liturgy, too. Right. <laughs> But, well, you know, but, but, what but here's what's happening. There, there's a twofold reaction to this. On the one hand, uh, the majority of Catholics are going to look upon this and say, this is just great. The Pope is out building bridges to people. Uh, he wants to draw people to himself. He's changed this condemnation, which we're used to in the past. And then there's going to be a small minority which will say, this is an indication that he is not a legitimate pontiff, that he does not have the faith. And, and on that point, I know when people hear this, it sounds so shocking, but, you know, there have been 29 false popes in the history of the church, 29 anti-popes. So if this is indeed the case, it's hardly anything that's completely new. Well, the concept of there being false or anti-popes is, is nothing new. You know, even after the church just gained her freedom, 
under Constantine. Very soon there was an anti-pope. It was the clergy of Rome that was trying to impose the anti-pope against the true pope, Damasus I. Mm -hmm. And the, whole, the reason why they wanted to get a, a false pope to replace the two pope, true pope was because Damasus I was trying to reform the priest's worldly ways. This was less than two generations after the church escaped from the catacombs. Mm -hmm. So, no, it's nothing new to the church to find, find this happening. Uh, what is new is that the idea that, that a pope could do things like this. I've That's had people no tell me, yeah. I've, I've had people tell me, well, how can you even question uh, that he's the pope? Or how can you even suggest he's not? They look upon that as though you are questioning the church itself, as though the church had defected. But from my point of view, and I think the Catholic point of view that the popes have expressed in the past, it is actually questioning the church's uh, existence to suggest that a pope, a real pope, could do these things. Even moreover, not only with the voodoo chiefs, you have a question of John Paul II getting blessed in front of thousands of people, marked with a sign of the adorers of the Shiva god Vishnu by a Hindu priestess. Now, we read that St. Paul said the gods of the Gentiles are devils. The first commandment says, thou shalt have no false gods before me. And the idea that, that you know, a, a supreme pontiff can do something like this, and again, consistently. Well, it's, it's, unthinkable. Unthinkable. it's unthinkable. I mean, none of us here are admirers of Andrew Greeley, I'm sure. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, uh, Shakespeare's words, can the devil speak truth, or can the devil speak true, might apply here. Andrew Greeley publicly announced just a couple of years after John Paul II was, was elected um, that if he had done these things 50 years before, he would have been excommunicated for what he was doing. He would have been publicly branded as a non-Catholic. And I think Greeley was right. It was a liberal acknowledging the truth. So, I mean, Catholics have a right to be puzzled. They have a right to wonder how this can be. See, it has to do with the mission of the church. You know, our Lord uh, is the, the Son of God made man. He came among us in order to die for our sins. He established his church. He gave to his church his truth, his sacraments. He laid out the law, the, what we must do. He is the great lawgiver of the New Testament, contrary to what Martin Luther said, who despised the notion of a lawgiver. He is the one Savior. Nobody goes to the Father except by Him. There is no other means of salvation. There is no other name given to us by which we can be saved. He commissioned His apostles. He said, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes shall be saved. He that does not shall be condemned. That is the mission of the church. That is the reason the church is persecuted and why the popes were persecuted. When the popes uh, fulfill uh, that mission, they are despised, they are hated, they are lied about. The, the number of books that have been written to, to castigate, to defame, to calumniate the papacy are innumerable, and all of them, in a certain sense, are a negative uh, testimony to the fidelity of the papacy, to the mission that was given to it by our Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason that the post-Vatican II popes are so popular with the world is because they have abdicated. They have set aside, in effect, that mission, if not formally and explicitly, in fact and in practice, and the church is in shambles. Millions upon millions are losing their faith. Horrible things are being taught in Catholic institutions. Children are being corrupted and perverted in so-called Catholic schools. The faith of young people in so-called Catholic colleges is being destroyed. There is blasphemy, there is sacrilege, there is perversion, there is corruption among the new clergy, the scandals that we read about in the Novus Ordo clergy, the, the horrible things that we don't even like to mention, these are all part and parcel of this new religion, this new modernist church that has come out of the Second Vatican Council. It is an abomination, it is worthy of condemnation, and our Lord will certainly uh, inflict a terrible judgment and punishment because these men in His name are doing the work of Lucifer. That is what they are doing. I know it sounds like strong and excessive language. But when we're talking about the glory of God and the salvation of souls, we're talking about the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, or uh, against it, we're talking about the work of Lucifer. 
And Lucifer's mission is to deprive God of his external glory insofar as is possible and to send as many souls to hell as he possibly can. And that is why we remain traditional priests, because the church's counsel in times of confusion to our Catholic children is always hold fast to the tradition. You know that's true. As long as you do that, you can't go wrong. You've been watching.